What's up, y'all? I've been having an exceptionally bizarre month, for me at least. I mean, my life's probably already pretty bizarre to most people, but, like, I kind of got all of my anime videos done for this month, like, written and voiced before the month started and handed them all over to the Davu to edit. So I, I was, like, at liberty to do whatever I want for the month of May in terms of, like, writing longer videos or tackling other subjects or doing anything. <laughs> and so I've chosen to spend my time um, recording an insane number of podcasts, vlogs, uh, Let's Plays, all this random crap that I keep putting out, and then watching no anime at all. I don't think I've watched a single anim episode of anime this month so far. Ugh. And instead I've watched, like, six episodes of Twin Peaks, 22 episodes of the X-Men cartoon from the 90s, and then I started reading some comics here and there. Particularly, I got this... I bought... I was at the store... I kept, I kept seeing this at the store, and I kept wanting to buy it. I've never, I hadn't read it until now, but it's Seconds by Brian Lee O'Malley, the guy who wrote Scott Pilgrim. I still don't own Scott Pilgrim, much to my chagrin. I found it one time, I found all six volumes for six dollars a piece at a fucking uh, used bookstore up the road from me. And I like slept on buying it, and then they disappeared. And I can never decide if I want to get the color versions or the black and white but the point is, Scott Pilgrim is one of my favorite things ever. Like, if I said it was one of my favorite comics, it wouldn't mean much, because, like, this is all the comics I've read, is, like, this little span right here of my collection. Um, and, like, a few that I borrowed from a friend, like Scott Pilgrim. But, uh, it is my favorite comic and one of my favorite stories, so I was kind of excited to read something new from Brian Lee O'Malley, and I figured it wasn't going to be, you know, as epic <clears throat> or as, like, meaningful as Scott Pilgrim, because... For one thing, it's just one book. Um, one book that is, like, $25, which is why I slept on buying this for so long. Because, Jesus Christ, $25 for a book, I don't know. I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm a very try-before-I-buy type of uh, buyer, you know? I like to buy stuff I'm already a fan of. So, this was kind of like banking on the name recognition of Brian Lee O'Malley. And I'll say that I, I did enjoy this book a lot. I, I thought it felt... Uh, it feels very small. It <clears throat> it feels like a movie. I read this whole thing in, like, less than two hours. It took, like, maybe 90 minutes at the most. I think this would be, like, if this was an animated film, it would fit just perfectly into that, uh, that feel. It's very brisk and breezy and fast-paced. Really charming art. I would say that uh, O'Malley's art has improved dramatically since... I mean, not to say that Scott Pilgrim wasn't well-drawn. I love the art in that, but I think that he's definitely you know, shown even more improvement in his character designs and expressions and action, and the colors in this are great. Um, just from the first page, like, I just want to show you how striking I find the colors here to be. I don't know if it'll actually look good on... actually does look surprisingly good on camera. Just the way that this, uh, this, like, red scene with this yellow hair popping off of it is very striking and memorable to me. Um, so this is basically a monkey's paw... Sort of like a time-traveling story, in a way, or an alternate universe hopping story, where this girl named Katie uh, finds these mushrooms that let her um, not go back in time, but let her hop into a timeline where she didn't make a mistake that she made in the original timeline. And so she starts hopping between all these timelines, trying to make her life perfect. And, uh, you know, without getting too deep into the story itself, because you can just read the damn thing, like... It's it's very solid. I love Katie as a character. She was really relatable to me because she's like this really arrogant sort of perfectionist person who other people like kind of respect and admire her and like some of them want to be her friend and want to be around her because of the, like her, you know, being a good leader and being a talented person. But at the same time, she's so arrogant that she's kind of intolerable and people, you know, like are more stressed when she's around in a way and like sort of push her away. So, it, for me, that's kind of how I feel when I'm around my friends, is that, you know, I feel like uh, I am respected more so than liked by a lot of people. And um, so I got kind of that vibe out of her. And it was fun to read a book about an older character. She's supposed to be, like, 29. And, you know, like, with Scott Pilgrim, it was very much, like, early 20s ennui. This is, 
like, now I've done something with my life, Ennui. It's like a different level, you know, the, the story of this, and I, I really think this is like, in a lot of ways, a meta story. Because it's called Seconds, and so the very first thought I had was, well, it's his second big work. You know, like, I mean, Brian Lee O'Malley has written comics before Scott Pilgrim, but like, Scott Pilgrim's what made him famous, and, you know, is an incredibly uh, well-known comic series, so... I felt like when I saw the name Seconds, I was like, it's the follow-up book. Like, of course it is. And that's basically what the story is. It's that Katie had opened up this restaurant called Seconds that got extremely popular and, like, she's this incredibly well-respected chef. But because she co-owns the restaurant, um, you know, with these other people, then, like, she doesn't feel like it's truly hers. So she wants to make this new restaurant and, you know, build it from scratch on this plot of land that she always wanted, and she wants everything about it to be perfect. And this, the story is basically about how her trying to make everything go perfectly is what drives her down this road of, you know, trying to correct the past until things get out of control. And, of course, she has to learn the pretty obvious lesson that's coming, that uh, you can't always be perfect. And I thought it was really interesting that this story is so tight so tightly constructed that it feels like at the same time it's it's a message about not like how chasing perfection is wrong but at the same time you can tell that it was crafted very particularly that this was like that this was something that maybe he was trying to make something perfect and like getting past that hurdle was exactly what he had to do to make this thing you know i mean i'm sure you could find maybe little pot, plot holes or, or, or just conveniences. The story is, it's, it, it's told in a very fast and loose way with a sense of humor that makes it so it doesn't have to be airtight in every element of its narrative. But I think that, uh, you, you can really tell that whereas Scott Pilgrim sort of meandered a little bit and it had like, it didn't feel like it was as tightly woven. It felt like it, um, you know, had long passages that were a little self-indulgent. Whereas this story is just like point to point, it feels very complete. Again, I think if this was a film, it would be like a great blockbuster type film. Not blockbuster, like a, well, that's not a good example because now those are big and bloated. I mean more like one of those tight thriller films that you watch and it's just like, yeah, all the way through. And it's very satisfying, even if it doesn't necessarily hit you on a deeper level. But I don't think it's shallow either. Like, it obviously doesn't have the breadth of ideas that Scott Pilgrim had, where that story touched on so many things that it could be relatable to so many people. Whereas this one, it's still great. Like, all the characters are well-written and all the interactions are well done. But it's, you know, it's a small condensed story. It's good for what it is, and I liked it. Um, and the only reason I don't feel bad about paying $25 for it is that at least I'm supporting an artist who I'm a fan of. So, the other comic I was reading, which unfortunately I can't just pull off a shelf and show you, is a webcomic called Strong Female Protagonist. And this one I've been really enjoying. It's, it takes place in a world where in 1991 there was a giant storm that covered the whole earth and all the babies who were born that year... I don't know if it was all the... But most of the babies who were born that year uh, turned into superheroes once they were, like, 14. Everyone just suddenly developed superpowers um, of, like, a huge variety of types. And then this story takes place when all of those people are in their, like, early 20s. And they've basically... Over the last five years, there was, like, a... It, it's sort of got, like, a Watchmen sort of, like, mentality, or, like, the Venture Brothers or Inc the Incredibles, where, like, it's a story that takes place after most of the superhero stuff happened. Like, the golden age of what superheroes were doing. Where, like, you know, in those five years, there were all these supervillains that showed up and all this massive crime, and the superheroes were fighting the supervillains, but all that's basically over now. There's no supervillains left. They've cleaned up everything, you know... And the main character, who is uh, a girl named Allison Green, who at one point had been called Mega Girl, decided she didn't want to be a superhero anymore because she thinks that superheroes aren't really making a difference in the world. That um, now that they've taken care of all the supervillains, then it's pointless to keep doing her job. And so she tries to live a normal life and just be a college student. And the story is about her trying to figure out what to do to change the world in a meaningful way. And confronting all these other superheroes and villains and different people who have their own ideas about how to change the world. And it's 
basically just one big ideological battle that has tons of social commentary. In fact, the whole thing is pretty much just social commentary. But it is deeply interesting. And I would say, if I had to compare the storytelling style and, like, what I think will be a problem that some people might have with this, if you're not a fan of, like, the writing style of Urobuchi Gen is what it reminds me of, like Psychopaths, where every character was kind of an ideologue first and a character second to an extent. And I, I, I don't know if that's as true of this story, but, like, every character is very ready to explain their entire methodology and ideology and, like, everything about themselves. You know, every character is ready to just totally thought dump uh, on the audience. Most of the, the comic is, like, long, protracted philosophical conversations punctuated by big action, you know, set pieces. Well, I shouldn't say big. I should say small action set pieces that are really well done and dramatic. Um, but the ideas presented in the story are just so interesting. It really comes at, like, sociological problems from every conceivable angle. And it's very much written from the perspective of, like, this age of social justice, like, stuff going on in the world, you know, of, like, the current cultural movement of what's going on. And it presents that in a very even-handed and interesting way that I think if this is what the conversation about social justice always was, it would be a deeply interesting and uh, helpful conversation for everyone to be having. Like, this comic seems to have this pulled-back viewpoint that sort of understands every side of the social conflicts going on right now and can present each of them in a way that you really get where it's coming from, you know? And it's, it's, it's obvious that the that the authors are on, like, a certain side, but they also have a understanding of the other side, you know? So I think it's a... Uh, in a way, I could even call it an important story. It feels like someone's fucking... Like, this feels like it was written as, like, a graduate thesis on sociology or something. Like, like it was trying to, you know, have every possible... Uh, sociological outlook presented in the story with its different characters. And the way I'm describing it might make it sound kind of obnoxious, and to certain people it probably will be, but, like, it still manages to be a great superhero story. All of the powers are presented really uh, de in, in a lot of detail. Like, each character you'll have, like, there's, like, very scientific descriptions of why they are the way that they are. Like, it's it's a really realist take on the whole superhero thing, um, the super, each character has superhero, uh, powers that are, like, evolving as the story goes on, you know, so there's all these, like, new things being learned about how the powers work, what are their limitations and their strengths, um, and there's just some really interesting takes on classic superpowers, like, there's one character who essentially turned into, like, a giant sharp rock monster, and he's got, like, blade hands, but it then turns out that part of the reason for that is that, like, he gained superpowers, but also he had cancer, and the cancer also g gained, like, accelerated superpowers. So, like, he has super cancer, basically, in addition to his powers, and it's killing him slowly, you know, as a, like, in a trade-off for his strength. And it's, it prints, it, there's lots of interesting stuff like that, and, uh, and, um, cool interplays of different powers and how they work against each other. And also, it does the whole, like, everything that those Man of Steel movies are trying to do with Superman having all the power and, you know, he has to decide whether people are really worth saving and all that bullshit. This story does that so much better, so much better than those movies. Like, it presents that idea in a fully formed, well-thought-out way with believable characters who make sense. Like, if you've always thought that that Man of Steel is, like, a, a lame portrayal of Superman, but that that, that 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 should be an interesting character arc, that's the character arc the main character has to go through, where she's, like, basically indestructible, and she could kill everyone if she wanted to, but, you know, she has to, like, navigate the moral choices she's making, but not in the form of some weird fucking Christ allegory thing that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, yeah, I really like this comic. Um, I'm upset because now I'm caught up, which means I have to wait fucking for new chat, new pages. It's one of those, like, two pages a week update webcomics. And knowing me, I'll just never read it again until years later when it's completed some more chapters that I could just read through it all then. But, uh, you know...
I'm I've been pretty satisfied with what I've gotten. It's gotten to a point in the story that like even if it ended now, like enough has happened and there's been enough ideas presented. Like it kind of feels like it's moving into a new chapter now. Sort of like if you finished the Chimera Ant arc in Hunter Hunter and then like moving on to the next thing after that. Like it feels like we're done with a with a sort of era in the story and it's moving on to the next era. So I'm very excited to see what it could present later because so far every chapter has like even if it starts off like not entirely sure where it's going, they've always come around into like a big event piece that feels good and is like a cool conclusion to that arc. So, yeah, curious to see where it'll go. Check it out if it sounds interesting to you, and uh, seconds if you can find it, if you're willing to pay $25 for a fucking hardback comic that you'll read in 90 minutes. And that's it.